we're going to talk security. When Mr. Duffett asked me to be master of ceremonies and chairman for this afternoon session, he probably have something in mind, uh, but knowing me, he lost control of the session, and these guys also lost control. I want to change the scope a little bit. And I need you to help me to challenge these guys and work with me. Because hacking is sexy. It's so easy to talk about attacks. How much money we're losing and our customers are losing and how many calls that are placed. I want to turn this around and talk about VoIP security in a broader sense. And <laughs> they're getting nervous. And Yes, this is the bingo. Because nice. the whole security ar area is much more than hacking attacks. It goes all the way down to your systems, to your backup. I mean, what's the cost of not having a working PBX in your company Millions. for a day, for two days? <coughs> if you can't find that Digium card or Sangoma card that you were using that broke down, there's so much to consider here. In the middle, we have application faults, and I guess you can blame me for a lot of them in the zip stack, but <laughs> I, I, I focus on creating new bugs every time I code, instead of repeating myself. But anyway, we have an ecosystem that works together, and the worst part is really in that lower corner, the yet unknown bugs, stuff we find all the time in products like Asterisk that is such a complex product. There is something called the VoIP Security Alliance that is kind of sleepy right now, but they actually, when they were alive, defined VoIP security in five different areas. And this is a very good, they have good documents on VoIP essay.org that you should properly read and look into. But the abuse, the attacks, is only one area. Now in the kind of after prism uh, era, we need to look at other things as well. And believe me, IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, really takes this seriously. There's reviews being done on every single protocol, all the security mechanism we had, discussions, if this is enough, what can we do to deliver more privacy, more integrity, more confidentiality to our users? We need to do the same. So, <clears throat> we have an ecosystem. We have my buggy software that Guys like Jonathan here is trying to clean up. We have GUI front ends that creates really interesting bugs, right? Security issues, other things. People often expose all of this to the internet. In the best case, maybe, with a firewall SPC, and we have an interesting discussion there. Should we just design the internals and say, oh, security, that's the SPC. They're going to fix everything. Or should we actually be better prepared? Because the SPC might not be able to protect everything. This is a very interesting perspective that JR opened for discussion earlier on. And I would like to come back to that. But you know the worst part in all of this? You, you. You, you. Our users and admins. And we have issues here. And we keep repeating discussions in the Asterisk developer community when people say, people are doing this. They're adding extensions 4,000. We use the name 4,000. And guess what password they're adding? 4,000. We have a password, so we're more secure than the old PBX. And many developers say, that's stupid, we can't fix that. I believe we have to do whatever we can 
to help our users. Because what's going on with Asterisk is that we're bringing IP and internet technology to PBX admins from the telco industry that never ever went to a security masterclass. They never ever learned anything about IPsec and password vulnerabilities. They never listened to these guys. I believe this is something that we all should try to fix. We have users with lots of telecom experience, but no experience of running internet-facing servers. And they are placing asterisks there. Regardless, if all of us developers stand up and say, that's stupid. So I don't think we can assume that they're stupid. We can't assume that they have this knowledge. We can't assume that something else outside of our ecosystem, Ward, I'm talking to you, right? <laughs> something else is going to fix this. We need fail to ban. We need to know these tools that Philip has been working with you and will continue all night and tomorrow. <laughs> and we need to understand this, right? Uh, so don't assume Philip will be rocking and drinking on the party at 8 o'clock. He's going to be here with you. Because we're adding stuff now. We're adding WebRTC. And this means, this means that even systems that used to be protected on the inside, people will, for experimentation and cool stuff, start connecting this to the Internet. So it's not getting better. It will get worse. And all of you in this room are members of my new task force here. I haven't heard the speakers mention this. I just wanted to put up a slide saying that during the years we added stuff. And the most important part is actually Jonathan here that added, inspired by my code, named ACLs. How many here are using that? What can we say? We keep developing these tools. And Nobody hears them. Right now it's like Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, I don't want to be. Well, what I was saying is right now it's just a way of configuring ACLs in a, in a more centralized manner. But, but with a little bit of work, it could also be used to modify ACLs on the fly. Um, and that keeps people from accessing like certain endpoints and such through certain addresses and that's basically the idea. So my original code, we had manager interfaces, CLI interfaces, all kinds of interfaces. Probably now we could add ARI to manage the named ACLs. Uh, this means that we could actually integrate something like fail to ban into asterisk if we have named ACL with timeouts. But the question here is really, what's missing? And what can we do together to change this? All of these systems, right? And I really want us as a group now, as a task force, to focus on what we can do and put on the action list. There are things missing. And guys like me and Jonathan and developers here, we need to listen to you and see what we can do in order to make sure that we're really, really delivering stuff that people expect. So why don't we start with this question? We have a system. We have users of no experience. Is it really our responsibility to help them? What do you think, Eric? Very much so. I mean, we have to start blocking and making things less obvious or less mistakes available to them because they will make mistakes. They don't know what they're doing wrong, and they'll do something stupid without even realizing it. OK. Nir? Um, I think it's, part of the, it's partially our responsibility, on, on one hand, as developers, to prevent That's a task from, group, right? Yeah, to, from saying, OK, we are preventing you from doing stupid things. But we, you know, at the end of the day, we can look at something that people will do, the users, admins, and we'll say, interesting, but very stupid. 
because at the end, they'll do something that we didn't expect. Uh, if you okay. take a tool like FreePBX, there are just the section for the outbound dial and dial commands. You have like 60 different variations in there. We won't be able to cover everything. But we should be able to say, okay, here are your best practices and these are the things we're looking for. And it's something that we need to do that both as developers and, and the task force saying, these are your guidelines, follow these, you have to follow these. If you don't, you'll break it. Okay, anyone else that have a comment on this? Flavio? Oh. Yeah, I think in the books that we, we wrote, the first thing is to try to give examples that are not <coughs> misleading like using 4000 with the password 4000. So to be from the first time they are using those, those books they say okay put a, a password here that is a super secret something that it's really secret but, but please don't don't use super secret on the, on the passwords it's the next thing the hackers will try. <laughs> That's okay? my password huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to change everywhere. You now you have to change everywhere. Anybody see so space balls? We need, we need to put <laughs> those things on trainings too. Okay. From the start, security. So has training to be material from the start. documentation. Yeah. Everything. Best practices. Uh, we need we need to update this training okay. books and everything to be safe from the beginning because it's very hard to do it later. So it's like drying ice, this thing about yeah. patching and securities. If you don't build securely, it's very hard to do it later. So go ahead. Great. So I've seen that elastics have some security guidelines, even in English. Uh, anybody read them? Has anyone read them? Nobody Here's your answer. Has anyone okay. heard about them before <laughs> now? <laughs> How many here have seen readme.seriously in asterisk? Okay. How many have read it? How many of you understood it? Okay. <laughs> Hands going up and down. Uh, Ward. I'll see here. How do you distribute this information to your users like Read Me Seriously? Do you have a security guidelines? Uh, we do have security guidelines and what we have found with PBX and a flash is you could put it in letters three feet tall and nobody would ever read it. Um, what we have started doing, we have a product called Incredible PBX that pre-configures everything with encrypted Shameless passwords, <laughs> really long, ugly passwords, and pre-configures fail to ban, pre-configures IP tables, and completely locks down the server. And to me, you know, if we're ever gonna get secure servers, <laughs> you gotta have a turnkey solution that provides it on the front, and then make them go dig for the information to uh, open it up. They never open it. They won't even look for it. They won't know it's supposed to be there. But then they won't use the phone system. The problem, there's a problem here. There, there's a balance between security and functionality that you need to keep. Um, well, you can keep, it, you can keep it functional on the inside. Uh, again, the but at the end of the day, what will happen is that, uh, okay, here's a scenario. Uh, you come in, we'll, we'll push out a new PIOF, we'll push out a new FreePBX free distro, fully secured, TLS, SRTP, IP tables, fail to ban, open VPN, you name it. You can't go in without really opening it up. You really have to mean it to open it up. Then it gets to this in, low life, pardon me, integrator in <laughs> Hicks Valley, God knows where. He looks at it, goes click, 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 takes the phone, the hell with this, I'm throwing this away. So what have we done? We've created a highly secured system that nobody can use. That doesn't help us because we'll basically kill, we'll be shooting ourselves in the leg. That's what Elastics It's trying to do. <laughs> Elastics, in my perspective, although I like it as, as a general idea, has many flaws when it comes to security. Uh, architecture, design, it is too much of a bloatware to be able to say, yes, it is, is it okay. that? We, we, let, let's say we assume you are right, that products like Elastics and properly PBX in a flash and so had many security holes. Multiple. How can we together start acting on them? It's not our responsibility. 
The problem is that they're b built of too many parts. What, okay. what is our responsibility? Are we responsible to, to, for Apache? Are we responsible uh, for PHP? People just love these distributions, and if it fails, they'll look at it and say, asterisk is bad. That's no okay. problem. It's an issue of perception. Nope. There will always be an asterisk. We have a security policy. We have ways to handle it. And we reported quite a lot of bugs, security flaws. We report them openly. We fix them with priority. And we have a very open process. What about these other products? I don't know. I haven't checked. Anyone that knows right. Elastics, free PBX, Sol, security you, policies? Saul, you have something? Yes. Uh, what we did is... Uh, we we being... We in my company, we ran... We what we ran... What we did is uh, run the Fortify and Outpost uh, to the Elastics. Uh, and I, of course, find a lot of bugs in all of... Uh, uh, miscoding, stuff like that. So go with the people from Elastics. They're from Ecuador, if you don't know. <laughs> and uh, they, they come to visit us and we share all the information that we have. There's, there's a tons of a code that, that, that is miscoded. And uh, now we're fixing it. Uh, actually, we're, we're helping them to uh, do a better um, um, Elastics that is 3 point. See a little I bit guess. better mousetrap. Uh, and we are working with them Scarproof. in constructing the 3.0 elastics. That now it is coming fixed it with this Turn recoding. It is all, of course it is not all fixed, but it, it has the most uh, vulnerabilities that, that is covered now. Cool. Thank you. Uh, there is a European product called Gemain Shaft. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, Stefan Wintermeyer created something called Gemain Shaft Fünf. German is an interesting language. Uh, anyway, uh, he built a total, what he believed was totally secure distro. Uh, he promised an English version for two years. I don't believe that will happen. But he started with encrypted file systems for logging, secure syslog, and went all the way up the stack. Uh, the problem he faced when he really wanted secure communication with the phones, that there was no good phones. And the phone vendor said, no one asked for it, so it if you look into the documentation, you buy a phone with SRTP capabilities and a video screen, documentation may say that while well, we can encrypt one channel of ALO, but we can't encrypt G729 and not video. But the product sheet says SRTP. How can we change this Part. What do you believe? Bad implementations in the phones. Well, the market will eventually drive them to put those features in. If people, the more the more people ask for those features, the vendors will step up one day and okay. start implementing. So I, I don't know. The ecosystem of uh, uh, VoIP telephones is uh, they'll eventually solve that problem. So you've been working with VoIP for how many years, Jr. Nine. Eight, How many years. customers do you have that require security in the platform? Uh, that that specifically demand it and ask for it. Uh, I've only had one customer that wanted it. Oh, that's 100% <laughs> more than I had. Yeah. Uh, I had one customer in a, a public bid request for proposals, went out and said, TLS required, SRTP required. And I said, yeah, finally we can do some work in Asterisk and we can do this stuff. So I asked tons of questions about how to implement this. Which public CA for the TLS and all of that? I got one response a week later. TLS and SRTP are no longer required. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, how close I got. So somebody actually so we, we term. need customers to require something. <laughs> now, a lot of people in this conference tells me that after the Prism stuff, Customers have started to ask for this, and that's really good. I hope to put it in requirements when they buy the phones. Someone? Flavio. Flavio. Nope. UDP okay. most of the time. Not even TCP. So <laughs> to answer this question, we've been looping around a bit. That's me. I'm jet lag coming from Sweden. 
uh, uh, try to stay in focus. Are we talking security here? No. Okay. I think we agreed upon that it's our responsibility to help them. What I said earlier today in the talk was that customers will probably never ever require this. They just have believed for 10 years that this is what we delivered. They always trusted the telco, they trust us to deliver secure platforms. In uh, WebRTC, we have taken years of discussion. We've been fighting. I've been quite active on the security side here. Where is he going and we this? finally have a decision that all the WebRTC calls will have to use SRTP, otherwise it's not at all WebRTC. We will encrypt everything. We'll use SRTP and DTLS for key exchange. So at least something happened. Uh, we're moving forward a tiny bit, small steps. But we did get it wrong with SIP. We got it right with WebRTC. But it's been quite a fight. Now, WebRTC, I stated here that we will see more servers facing the internet. Do you agree with me? Are we ready for this? Absolutely. 100% ready. You're ready? <laughs> yes. As long really? as people yes. pay you for your services. I can see him shaking. I put yeah. access list on my gateways. <laughs> He's ready. <laughs> <laughs> nobody. I, I blacklist everybody and whitelist nobody. So I'm ready. Well, I just saw a demo up here of free PBX, including now a WebRTC client. <clears throat> and that made me really happy and a bit scared. What do you say, Eric? WebRTC is going to be really scary for a lot of reasons. It kind of bypasses. People have this illusion that NAT is security. Okay, Firewalls are security. If I have either of these, I'm safe. The reality is WebRTC completely ignores them. It goes around them. Okay, These are not proper secure methods, and people have been kind of... Skype is doing that already. You yeah. already lost the battle, Eric. Yeah. So no, what, what are you worrying about? <laughs> Skype is peer-to-peer, one-to-one. Not entire, not, peer anymore. Not, not entire corporations based on this theory that I'm safe. People aren't, aren't hacking Skype to get money. People aren't doing the same level of denial of services against Skype users the way they're going to against regular companies that are going to use us for call centers, for all sorts of applications. And suddenly you're going to realize, you know what? Oh shit, the, the genie is out of the bottle and we have no way of putting it back. It's dangerous and people don't know what they're asking for yet. It's still too new. So, Philip, what, what scares you with WebRTC? Would work. Which uh, part? Well, WebRTC is a, a technology and opening up ports on your asterisk. It just creates another attack vector that you're going to have to watch and you know constantly stay up to date about exploits or possible vulnerabilities. Uh, in general, um, I believe a lot of the PBX stuff that we do do and we do look after it really is the end user's responsibility to get some knowledge on how to secure their own infrastructure. That will never happen. I know, but it's like people sell guns, you know? Yeah, here. So, yeah, here in the US. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what was the, you'll, you have similar, you know, topics around the same sort of questions. You're okay. giving somebody something potentially dangerous. They, they have to have a little bit of common sense. I think it's really a big education point if you're going to get this and you're reselling this, really tell the user, look, these are potential issues. You'll want to you know, address so them, watch them, and look after them. WebRTC for ZIP folks can be seen as a media layer, right, with RTP handling audio and video, actually SRTP. And that's cool. How many here have heard about the data channels? For Very WebRTC. few hands. Mm -hmm. In WebRTC, Apart from peer-to-peer, browser-to-browser, audio and video, the protocol also involves a data channel that goes peer-to-peer -peer between the browsers for file transfers, chats, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, that sounds scary. <laughs> it, can uh, okay. be, it can be beyond scary. You answered my question before I posted, it, right? Uh, it, yeah, but it can be beyond scary. WebRTC opens a whole new ball game in terms of security because now we are no longer in control of what happens at the edge device. Let's say we rewrite a soft phone. Yay, so we've got PJ SIP or we've got some other SIP stack. We know exactly what's in there. 
But we're talking about WebRTC, so we're talking on a browser. So Chrome and Firefox, we're now opening a whole new, uh, I'd say, can of worms in regards to security. We hear about security pitfalls in browsers every day. Not to, well, I'm not mentioning the ever-dreaded Internet Exploder, but, <laughs> but okay. hey, you, you know, but it will happen. They will have bugs, and they will have security issues, and people will exploit them. But, I mean, JR is running his system on a perfectly secure intranet backend network, right? You won't yes. even know. You won't even know. Because I, if, if it's enough for me to write something that will proxy all the requests, and I'll mimic your WebRTC website, and it will proxy everything through a transparent, and I'll find out all your users, and you'll never find me. You'll never know who I am. Gee, I'll thanks. just be able Appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Especially when I'm we waiting get for that all day. When we get Android <laughs> phones on a desktop that with Chrome browsers, that will be interesting. Um, we what, only what, have a few minutes left. What, what do you mean when? Oh, okay. They're, they're already Sorry. out there now. Yeah, already yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Right. We, we, he's standing here holding one up for you now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Chromebooks. Cool. Yeah, but we're also getting SIP phones mm. being sold as SIP yeah. desktop phones with Android, with Android. a full yeah. operating system, including a router. Uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> we only have a few minutes left, but we actually, I'll decide that you're my task force, so we'll continue a bit over time. Uh, what can we do <clears throat> to make the situation better? Well, one thing you can do is attend sessions like this. We're going to continue tomorrow all day, so we have a lot of things to do. Hi, Mark. So, do you take notes? Because we're going to discuss what you're going to do. Mark Michelson, technical lead in Asterisk, is sitting there. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll start with the panel. I'll start with Flavio. Um, this is not just Asterisk. You're involved in OpenSIPs yep. and other platforms as well. What do you think we can do? Give me I action think, point. I think the role of the SBC will increase in the next years. The, the, the prices of the SBCs will, will get lower. In the, in the near future, we are seeing a lot of people developing those boxes. And it's much easier to have a single point of protection than to protect the whole network. For service providers, it's, it's very hard to protect when you have 10 gateways. And sometimes you have three, four Elastix box, 10 gateways, two SIP proxies, uh, two, three, four media gateways. It's, uh, sorry, media servers. It's hard to protect everything. It's hard to patch everything. So but, if you can have a single Flavio, point an of SPC protection. kind of preserves the whole idea of an insecure outside with hackers and a secure, nice, and friendly asterisk loving community on the inside it's where true. people it's carry routers in their pockets. It's true. It's, the SPC is not the, the only solution, but it, it, make it makes it a lot okay. better because it's almost impossible to to check everything in a complex network. It's hard. Yeah. Philip? Yeah, I think education is a really big thing from the resellers down to the end user. But I think one feature that I really like to see in Asterisk is I'd like to see some sort of average usage alert. So Average usage alert? Yeah, so okay. if we could have some mechanism inside that you, know, you could get a baseline from and then would alert you if a particular extension is doing something weird, I think that would be. Weird compared with what they've done before. Yeah. Okay. Like if you've got somebody all of a sudden dialing lots of international, okay. uh, being yeah. able to set some sort of you know internal flags for that, that would be really cool. That is a system I want to see for a long time, but possibly not in Asterisk. But I don't know, Erwin, have you seen what Uninet has done? Can you tell us a bit about it? There's actually an open source package that very few people know about. Erwin uh, is going to tell you very soon, as soon as I can. Get the mic around here. Okay, the software is called VoIPAID. Uh, it's an animality detector for SIP, and, and it's uh, self-learning, so it will flag uh, if you reach a certain threshold, and it, you can filter by machines or extensions or user who calling or who are calling them, and pretty much whatever you, you just described. Does it have a mechanism to shut down or stop those calls? Yep. Okay, cool. So it learns by reading the logs. And when a user 
to change his behavior quickly so he can react. And that's exactly what I've been wanting for a long time. Point eight is on uninet.no somewhere or software, open source unit. Okay, we'll get the URL. I like that. So it's a hidden gem that Philip is going to learn all night while you laugh for him and have a presentation about tomorrow. <laughs> okay. I was looking forward to the ping pong. <laughs> <laughs> no ping pong. We're, we're getting serious here. But so. Just, just to, to forget. Tomorrow, tomorrow then I'll show a system that you can use on the SBC and on the server at the same time. So better tomorrow, be here ten, tomorrow, 10 o'clock. JR, what can we do? Action points. Uh, a lot of, you know, what's already been said, you have to educate the system administrators, the folks that are building these boxes, administrating these boxes, getting the phone, setting the passwords. Uh, they've got to know their craft. You know, it's, uh, but can we do anything apart from telling them that they don't know anything and train them? Can we do something in the packages itself? Sure. I'm, a, uh, I'm an old school Debian guy. I like the approach of locking everything down when you do a base install. Nothing is available to Open you BSD. unless you go in and you turn it on specifically and allow access. So I like that approach, but I'm used to that approach. That doesn't work for many people because you are you go through the trouble of install, you go through a trouble of a configuration and it still didn't work because you didn't read the documentation, now you can't make a phone call. That's troublesome for a lot of people. Um, how do you get around that? It's it's all about user education, administrator education. Near? Um, just like JR, I do believe that education here is the key factor. Um, I. I don't agree with the idea that an SBC should be the only entity in the network that is in charge of your security. I think it's wrong. Um, I believe that security doesn't come from a tool or from a piece of software or anything that we will do. Security oh, comes we bought a firewall, so we are secure. Yeah, uh, we uh, paid for it. Yeah, we paid for it. An arm and a leg, and it still doesn't help us. No. Uh, I think that security is a process. Security is a design. It is something that you build inherently into your system. If it's not designed to be secured from day one, regardless of what you'll do, it will always have a pitfall. It will always have a point that people could go in. Your usernames, your DID numbers, your access points, your PSTN environment, even a PSTN system can be exploited. We were uh, in a meeting at RSA like a year and a half ago or two years ago, is that? A year and a half. A year and a half. And we were sitting in, at RSA Innovation Center in Israel. These guys are in charge of building encryption algorithms and, 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 and rendering services to banks. And it took me about three and a half minutes to hack their voicemail system and show them how I make calls. And they were like, uh, we don't know. We didn't know you can do that. That was like, and we were like sitting there. To, but we don't, and these are RSA. They have billions of dollars and they don't know how to handle it. They, like, they admit it themselves. Big. Eric, action points. I want action points here. Stuff well, we can do. I personally take a slightly different approach. The, the, the people who are attacking us are a semi-organized community. They have bulletin <coughs> boards. They have websites. We have, have a task force now. They have paid services. Okay. We need to reactivate the asterisk security mailing list. We need to start sharing information, what we've learned, where the bugs are, what the best ways to do it. Make the information available to all of the people and start getting the discussion going ongoing. This, as you says. This is a process. It's not a one time, I bought it, I fixed it, it's good forever. Every day we go out and fix it, they go find a new way in. And it's constantly going on. So we need to have an, uh, an equally strong group working together constantly to find ways to improve the systems, to make things better, to move forward, because it's a moving target. Yep. We, we would all love to be out of the job of doing security stuff. I have a, an idea for an optional, listen to this, I have an idea for an optional module for Asterisk. You have okay. named ACLs right now. Uh, maybe you want to have something like a named bad guys that gets centrally updated to Digium and people can pull it and query it as a part of the registration process. That doesn't have to be Digium. We're a community. Well, actually, but that, 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 that could exists. benefit all of these platforms. Yeah, there, there is uh, some of that already. Yep. No, probably there, there are some hidden actions around. Any questions from the audience? Any ideas on action points? OK. We thank you all. Only needed the exercise today.
Uh, Greg <laughs> Jennings with Seviar. Um, so I, I think there, there needs to be more done on the provider side because I, I use VoIP.ms, for instance, and I can't go to them and say, all right, limit my scope to, well, I, I can limit it to just domestic calls, but then you've got the, uh, the ones in Idaho and some other call pumping places that are going to jack it up. And I, I, you know, so I've basically put it on any call that, you know, exceeds a certain time parameter, which for my case, any call that's greater than five minutes is irrelevant. I, I can toss that one, but providers could do more to, to help uh, the situation. They you could, want, but they make well, the money, so well, why would yeah. they do that? Yeah. JR. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, a uh, tremendous amount of security thought goes into my users and to the, for the services that I provide. I don't allow international calling until the user actually calls me. I can turn it on and off per device. So it, I don't just go in and turn it on on the PBX with uh, 300 hosted phones and now everybody has uh, access to call international. I, I ask them or uh, try to push them toward an access code. So uh, yeah, you, you want to do can, things can, like that. You, is there a possibility we can start a working group in the SIP forum? They have the SIP Connect specification. Maybe you should start a group to enhance that with security recommendations. There's one thing that JR, JR is not an example of your typical SIP provider. Exactly. But He's JR not typical in any... Oh. Well. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's Thank not you. go there, please. Uh, the, okay. Have you ever met these, let's say, Tier 4 SIP providers? You know how they work? They can take asterisk, they install A to billing, and they start selling. Okay, what is wrong with that order? Simple. There's no security in it. I've nope. seen that happen. But it's not just the mom and pop shops. I mean, we're using SIP trunks for the mayor carriers in Europe. Yeah. No one has ACL list. No one has SRTP TLS. If we ask for TLS, they just look at us and say, what? We haven't got that. They don't regard it as something so that's anyway, for them. So anyway, a comment, short one. <coughs> and I guess we're overlooking this. I mean, it, it, as Asterix grows, I mean, this is, it's a good problem to have. I mean, there's, there's security issues, but it is I mean, let it, let it grow, let some things yeah. blow up, and those with money are going to reach out to the experts, fund the development, fund the growth of Asterix, and get these problems stemmed, that, as long as the customer realizes the limitations. That's of normally how the world works. That's blows up community work. Another question. Anyone? Comment? Idea? Back here. Cynical comments are welcome. Excellent. So e even phone guys know about a uh, little bit about security, but now I'm really worried because web developers and and SQL injection. Now we're going to give them away. Can you please leave? This room? <laughs> web web. Uh, I'm sorry for any web developers in the room, but web developers really scare me because um, we love web. Developers. Username and passwords in the JavaScript. That's fine. Well, I, I have an idea. I have a just. One wait, idea. Well, hang on. Yeah. Uh, how many here is aware of the security framework inside Asterisk? The new one? Wow. <laughs> but not enough. Mark, can you tell us a bit about it? Uh, yeah, I didn't know I was going to be talking here, but I can talk <laughs> a little bit about this. Um, basically, there are certain things that can happen in Asterisk, I believe starting in version... I can't remember if it's 1.8 or 11 off the top of my head, but certain events, like let's say, for instance, that a SIP... Uh, endpoint attempts to register to asterisk and fails or succeeds either way we'll just report some sort of uh, event it right now that event gets logged so that something like fail to ban could use those logs to uh, analyze uh, whether you're being hacked or not something along those lines um, but you know you can see things uh, via these events like whether someone tried to call but provided an incorrect password or something like that. Um, That's 11. And uh, as far as development plans for those security events are concerned, right now, like I said, those just go, go to a log file. But since they do use the event system in Asterisk, they could presumably be uh, enhanced to go out either AMI, ARI, or any of the other interfaces on which events can be uh, sent. And so when you have something like that in Asterisk, Asterisk can be just concerned with reporting what's going on, and the business logic uh, regarding what you want to do with that information can lie outside Asterisk. So th this is great, but 
when we launched this, did we get a flood of emails with suggestions on how to enhance this or patches in the bug tracker? Are you overwhelmed with all the suggestions you're getting? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. So we need more exists? feedback on what we can do with the security framework. We have framework that is not used enough. So you're all in my task force. I told you that, Mark. You should have been prepared for an attack. <laughs> okay. Any more? Here. Well, going back with the security things, have you thought about sending them via SNMP traps? Have we thought about sending them via SNMP traps? Anyone here? I can say in Chameleon OpenSIPs, we have SNMP traps. Uh, we can alert from the routing scripts. Uh, the asterisk SNMP module could potentially, when we get funding for that work, send SNMP traps based on the input from the security framework. I don't believe we're doing that right now. Not today. But that would be a very, very interesting stuff. Yes, uh, write a shake to me and Mark and we'll discuss who makes what. <laughs> write that one up. <laughs> it should be done. But it should be done. But Shameless clearly problem. in OpenSIPs and Camellio, uh, I've been working quite a lot with SNMP module and Camellio. We have the trap capability. I think for next year we need Astrid DevCon and then Astrid DEFCON. Astrid DEFCON, you're on. Okay, any other ideas? Over there. <laughs> okay, you're, you're, you're second. I saw this one first. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, man. I would need to run. Um, what about giving Next people uh, the option of uh, paying for a phone home to Digium uh, so that if they see um, particular sorts of attacks occurring or messages hitting uh, the, the VAR, VAR log messages or whatever, that they could actually um, get notified from Digium. Did you know this was happening? I, I can't okay, see interesting it. idea. Any comments? I, I can't see Digium Legal ever going for that. Yeah, yeah that's no. scary. That, 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 but that can we have anyone else? Hey, why don't you this send it to the NSA? Why don't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah no, oh, no. they got it already. If, if you're right. going to do okay, that, okay, okay. I get the message. <laughs> We're running late. Wait, wait. To, to finish that one? Uh, there was someone Ollie? here. What? To finish that one, yep. the organization that I involved is the CFCA that you want to talk about with that. They are specifically <laughs> aimed at the fraud stuff. So you want to check with them, you want to send them the information. They're the ones hooked up to MCI, to the FBI, the GSM Association. They pay attention and they track and blacklist phone numbers, IP addresses, et cetera. Um, Digium, it, they're not equipped but for it and it would be the wrong place to start with that. Please join the asterisk security mailing list and let's revive that and start discussion. Maybe some of this will be outside of asterisk, then we'll use the VoIP SA mailing list as well. But Keep pr putting pressure on that idea. Extending on what JR was saying earlier, Asterisk is designed to route our phone calls, not be our security endpoint. Bingo. How much do we want exactly. to stick in this before we start calling it bloatware because it's doing too much? Yep, yep. I agree. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a, a good, good point. point for discussion. I think we will have to take off with that discussion tomorrow. I'm keeping you locked in here in the task force, <coughs> but we have our second task force meeting tomorrow in this room where you will hear much more from these speakers and a few more. You'll get in-depth information, we'll run labs, and we have a second task group plenary panel at the end of the day. So make sure you're in this room because this is where you learn the important stuff. Thank you, all the speakers, and thank you, audience. I'll see you at the party, 8 o'clock. <laughs>